Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell and today we're going down the Axis, a rare Axis aircraft arena and we're going to talk about the Mitsubishi, the A6M0 or the Zeke as it was known to the Allies. But first, I have to address the fact that I do have a deal with Craig, my, my affectionado cameraman, and the deal was he does that, I do the hats. Greg has outdone himself today, and Greg, you're surely going to stir up the hat haters that say, don't use the stupid hats. This one is not only stupid looking, it is actually terribly confining as well, but we're going to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go ahead and try to get this thing off. There we go. I'm going to toss it off camera to my able assistant there, my contemptuous assistant. Greg Kenny, and I get my glasses on here so I can see a little bit in the brighter light. So <clears throat> I'm standing in front of our Midway exhibit, which is just about complete. And if you get over to the museum in the coming months, you're going to want to stop by and see that. And that will tell you about uh, the Battle of Midway and really was the turning point for the Allies in uh, World War II in the Pacific, especially the United States because that was what you could argue is the furthest line of advance with the Japanese as they attacked Midway Island. But today we're talking about the Japanese Zero. I'll give you a plan view of the fighter. This was, if there was anything close to a wonder weapon for the Japanese at the start of World War II, it was the Zero fighter. It was uh, first flown in 1939 it entered fleet service with the Imperial Japanese Navy in 1940. The designer on the aircraft was Hiro, or Hiro Hirokashi. I hope I did his name right. He worked on the 1MF10, uh, which was his first work. He later worked on the J2M, the Raiden, and the A7M, the Repu. The 1MF10 uh, had wheel pants. The other two were more pure uh, interceptor fighters, but the Zero is what he is known for. Now the Zero is, you know, in the last episode we talked about the ME-109 and the what Willie Messerschmitt was really working on, which was a very fast 12-cylinder uh, uh, high altitude at that time, what was considered high altitude fighter. The Japanese designers were going something a little bit different. I'm going to take the prop off Remember, we've talked about a radial, and we've also talked about that FW-190, so you got that flat front or a higher drag front with that radial engine we're going to talk about. But the, um, the Zero Fighter was designed to be highly, highly maneuverable. And at the time that it came into service in 1940, up until about 1943, it was probably one of or the best fighter in the world. Now, you German folks can argue with me about that and talk about the ME-109 or the FW-190, but uh, this aircraft was amazingly nimble. It was probably could outmaneuver anything in production at that time, and uh, it was incredibly lethal, and it did not have to be a... Uh, top ace to get kills in this airplane because the aircraft was so uh, superior, it really was uh, an amazing machine. Now, there were almost 11,000 of them built, 10,932. The prototype was known as Prototype 12. Now, what, the, what good old uh, Hero did with this airplane when he started designing it, first of all, they knew it had to be light. So one of the first things they did is they went with an extremely light aluminum. And it was a prototype aluminum that the Japanese had developed. It was not being used anywhere else in the world. Uh, it was prone to corrosion though, Greg. Did you know that if it wasn't treated properly, it could be prone to corrosion, which is one of the reasons why, by the way, although uh, we've talked about uh, Axis aircraft being scrapped across the globe, in the environment that these aircraft were left, let's say the hulks, the, the manufacture of the airplane did not help for restorers and, and pretty much anything that's out in the, left in the wild today, if you want to call that, is, is utterly worthless. They have to be 
completely rebuilt. But at the time, it was a very light aluminum. So what they were searching for was an aircraft that could be highly maneuverable at about 200 to 275 miles an hour. One of the things about the Zero, we'll talk about the, the strengths and the weaknesses, was as you got it up to higher speeds, it, the control services did not have any type of hydraulic assist and the aircraft, the surfaces, control surfaces at the higher speeds, the airplane got harder and harder to maneuver. That is one reason why when you hear about what they call zoom and boom attacks, that's not me chasing Greg after he gives me these ridiculous hats, but the zoom and boom attacks that the Flying Tigers came up with where they were using the much heavier P-40 and going by the Zero was, the Zero could not follow them into that dive. And so they would make a, a gun run at the zero and then get altitude, break away, and, and get back up to altitude and do it again. But the zero uh, was not in contrast to what we talked about, like the uh, Focke-Wulf, the FW-190, or the uh, BF-109. They were not uh, as maneuverable at that higher speeds. Now, the Japanese had correctly ascertained, and let's talk a little bit about Japanese psyche that went into this design. The Japanese were essentially a maritime nation, and they knew that they had to de develop their trade routes or protect their trade routes as Japan industrialized more. They were very similar, if you want to talk about it, to uh, Great Britain in that they, they had to keep those lifelines of trade and materiel coming in to the uh, island, that island nation. So what they did was they, the Japanese knew that they were gonna have to defend these large expanses of ocean and the aircraft carrier, they're watching what the Americans were doing with aircraft carriers and they knew that uh, they were gonna need those aircraft carriers later uh, if they were gonna actually expand their sphere of influence. So what they did was they built a very big navy. Initially, uh, they were limited by the Washington Treaty and the battleship size, but like the Germans, they figured out ways to get around that and, and were actually uh, you know, working against the treaty. But uh, their initial thinking was, okay, big heavy battle wagons, everybody lines up and everybody uh, kind of shoots at each other. He who has the most ships actually will win uh, but as the airplane in many demonstrations became more and more effective against capital ships, they correctly surmised that the fighting over the horizon with these carrier-based aircraft in their area where they were fighting, not in Europe as much because you have bases and you can land airplanes, but if they were going to be fighting over water, they surmised that they needed both fighter interceptors and we're gonna talk about a couple of other rare aircraft, but the dive bombers and torpedo bombers, uh, in order to be able to attack enemy fleets that were in wherever they were gonna be operate, operating to, uh, to defend themselves and keep the, them building and have those natural resources. So the Zero was, was a great call by the designers. Uh, it, it, it had good armament, cannons and machine guns, but, and everybody's done a talk about this, no armor, they did not armor the airplane, it did not have self-sealing fuel tanks, and the reason for that, some people talk, well, that's the Samurai Code, it had nothing to do with it. The designers basically felt that they wanted, as the maximum performance, the best way to, the, the best uh, defense is a good offense, they wanted the maximum maneuverability of this fighter, and that was gonna keep the fighter alive. They did not wanna be in a situation where this aircraft had uh, shortcomings and they were going to have to have the airplane on the defensive. Now, once they did that, the Allies captured a series of zeros. The first one was up in the Aleutian Islands, and it's like a lot of things I talked about. It's been done a, a million times, but they did flight tests on the airplane they figured out a lot of what I told you, that it had uh, uh, sticky controls when it got up to higher speeds. Another little poor known thing is that the air, poor, poorly known issue was the aircraft did not roll well to the right. It rolled slower to the right than to the left. 
And so when they were briefing Allied pilots, not only zoom and boom, but if you were gonna brake on the airplane, you would brake to the weak point that it would roll because it would not, uh, it did not roll well in a certain flight characteristic. The one thing you did not want to get into this aircraft was in a turning fight. There's just no use trying to dogfight a zero. That's out. Your best bet is to hit fast, either the wings or just behind the cockpit. But if you miss, don't hang around. Be as bad as all that, sir. Seeing's believing. But if I were you, I'd take my word for it. In a turning fight with this airplane, uh, up until, let's say, 1944, unless maybe you're in a Mustang, or, or uh, one of the real late war American fighters, this thing would eat you alive. And it did have 20 millimeter cannons. It, it had a really, really good armament. But if you got into a turning fight with this airplane, you were pretty much toast. So, uh, so that is the quick overview on the Zero. I'm gonna put this down on its fuel tank, something you would never do if it was actually there. I'm going to talk about our salute today, and our salute today is uh, all of the Navy pilots, the U.S. Navy pilots that went up against the Zero uh, many times in very, very inferior machines. Brewster Buffaloes, FM2s, Wildcats, they, they were, if you were in any of those aircraft, P-40s, early, you know, uh, a very, very early, uh, the Dauntless, any of this, you were in real trouble. And yet they went out every day, even at Guadalcanal, uh, where this aircraft clearly outclassed anything that the Marines or the Navy were flying, uh, the, the Navy and Marine pilots continued to hold the day. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna salute you, and I'm going to salute you today. Greg has gotten really creative. Not only did he have me in probably the most bizarre hat I've ever seen, but he came up, this is a uh, product of Japan, Ramanue, I'm gonna take a shot at that. It is orange. Now, Greg will have to normally do a tour of the airplane. He'll have to do a tour of the, uh, the bottle in this because I will let a little secret go here. I had to open this prior to taping because there was a marble up in there that you have to push down. I've never seen anything like that. It's sealed in there, Greg, it's pretty cool. I don't know where you come up with this stuff. Now, um, this has a, oh, this is, has 110 calories, and it basically says, if large, fat Italian men drink this, you will die. I didn't know that, Greg, so you're going, you're trying to poison me today as well. So uh, we'll go ahead and give this a shot, but, but in all seriousness, go Naval Aviation and the United States Navy. My hat's off to all of those very brave uh, Navy pilots that right at the beginning of the war held the line. Cheers. This is interesting. Orange, it's not offensive at all. I could actually finish this one. The marble is interesting in that if you drink it, the marble comes up and closes it up. So I don't know if that's like to keep you from having too much of a portion there, but it's actually quite nice, Greg. The first time you haven't uh, tried to kill me, oh, this may be slow working poison of some sort, but uh, it's not terribly bad. So. What is the legacy of the Zero? And I'm gonna go out now on a little bit of a ledge, Greg, a little bit of a ledge. You know, when we talk about aircraft design and there's always give and take, and we've done 80 episodes of this thing now, we're pretty darn close to it, uh, and we've seen all kinds of different approaches, but the thing that I would argue with this airplane is American fighter design went from maneuverable and then to faster and faster and less maneuverable and less maneuverable. And then if you look at the way American fighter design came back with like Boyd and the fighter mafia and conservation of energy uh, and much more nimble machines, I would argue, I would argue, Greg, that the Zero would be a good example of that type of philosophy, completely different technology but the idea is that it didn't have to be as fast as let's say an ME-109 or an FW-190, but it was much more maneuverable. And in the right hands, just like American fighters, like the F-16, the F-15, these air superiority fighters, 
the Soviets, the Cold War folks, built a, a lot faster aircraft, but the American aircraft were much more maneuverable. And at the end of the day, the American aircraft carried the day. I would argue that you could take that all the way back to the zero as a design philosophy and say that that is a winning ticket all the way, the way through that. So if the zero has any legacy, not only is it a fearsome weapon, and we're very lucky, I, I do want to add, you know, we can look at some of this equipment and admire it for its, in its engineering prowess, but the Japanese as an opponent in World War II did terrible things, and we cannot support that. And, and we can look at their equipment and we can look and marvel at the engineering, but at the end of the day, we are extremely fortunate that the American ingenuity, British ingenuity, and that of far of the allies was able to defeat the, the people that were directing this equipment because uh, they, they, did, they did terrible things. And the Japanese in the Pacific were a very, very difficult opponent. Now, I'm going to go ahead and set this down as we move on out of here. We have talked about the cool World War II puzzles, and we are now going to give you another one that actually has some of this. Again, is suitable for framing. Another cool puzzle. Reach out to Jason. He'll ship this to you. This one is suitable for framing, and it has a lot of these Japanese aircraft in it. So you can see it, and it even has a zero. How cool is that? So you can go ahead and click on that link and Jason will be happy, happy to ship one of these out to you. Now, we cannot do all of this, including this fantastic new Midway exhibit without your donations. So please click on that donation link today. Give us a couple of bucks so we can continue to do all of this great work here and recognize all of these fantastic people and machines. Now, if you've come across us, on YouTube, and we earned your subscription today, I'd ask that you subscribe. Send us to a friend. I just came back from Reno, and I actually ran into people, shockingly enough, that actually had seen Warbird Wednesday. And Greg, they didn't say, what are those stupid hats, which I got very lucky about. But uh, like us on um, uh, Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, like us on YouTube. Uh, remember, uh, click uh, that notification button so you can find out whenever we've got another video that we have put up. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Have a great day.